Did you ever wonder how one medicine can treat multiple diseases? Could answers for tough to treat conditions be hiding in someone's medicine cabinet? And could computers unlock the secrets to tomorrow's medical mysteries? We'll answer all of this and more on our third episode of Things That Make You Go, huh? Things That Make You Go, huh? Hey, so funny story. Over the recent holiday break, I was home visiting my parents, and I noticed that my mom was throwing in a lot of laundry in the washer, and she cracks open a box of borax to use as detergent. So cut to about 15, 20 minutes later, and in all of the commotion, the kitchen sink becomes clogged, so what does my mom do? She grabs that same box of borax and pours it down the clogged sink, and I was like, this is kind of weird, but voila, right? Crisis was immediately averted, and... I was in total amazement that she was using this stuff to both clean her laundry and unclog the kitchen sink. Intrigued at this point, I end up Googling this magic powdery substance to find out what other magic tricks it has up its sleeve. And apparently this stuff has about 30 or more kind of MacGyvery type fix it's useful for any household maladies. Anyways, this got me to thinking about my daily life working here at Abbey and, and how some medications can treat more than one disease. And since I don't really understand how exactly this works, I decided to invite one of my colleagues from AV Redwood City to join us today to hopefully shed more light on this topic. Um, she's joining us via phone today from California. So without further ado, Susan Lacey, welcome to our podcast today. Can you please tell us who you are and what you do? Oh, sure. So I'm currently a member of the Immuno-Oncology Division at AV in Redwood City, California, And prior to this position, I was a member of the immunology and biologics divisions at the Abbey site in Worcester, Massachusetts. Awesome, Susan. Thanks for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Um, So let's get right to it. Um, So my first question would be, um, I guess I used to think that there was one drug for one disease, but recently I hear that maybe one drug may treat many diseases. So my question is, why is that? So when I hear your question, I think, well, if a medication has um, an ability to treat several different diseases, to me it means that the diseases must share a common element. Or another way to say it is that these diseases, although they look different, they probably are resulting from the same underlying issue in, in the body. And that tells me that there's some biological pathway that is supposed to normally function to keep our cells and our tissues and our organs healthy, but it isn't functioning properly. Um, It's unregulated or dysregulated. And because all those diseases share that, you know, mistake or error or imbalance, a medicine might be used across multiple diseases as a a treatment or prescription drug. That sounds pretty uh, straightforward, actually. Awesome. Thank you. I guess, um, can you give me an example, uh, maybe of some diseases that may result from like the same, what did you say, biological pathway? Oh, yeah. So there's actually many examples and, and, you know, I could go on and on. Um, One broad category that I think really exemplifies this idea is autoimmune disease. If we think about what the immune system does, the main function is to protect the body from microorganisms, things like viruses and parasites, bacteria. And so our body um, makes cells that help kill those things. Those are white blood cells or lymphocytes. And the immune system also produces antibodies. And together, these antibodies and these lymphocytes um, help kill and clear an infection. They get rid of it gets rid of invaders um, that the immune system knows are not ourself. They're different, and, and the immune system recognizes that. At least it does under normal conditions. And so what the body's trying to do is really clear foreign particles, foreign organisms, and maintain our own, our own body cells in a natural, healthy state. But in the case of an autoimmune disease, the immune cells actually end up unfortunately, attacking our own cells, our own healthy cells. And so it doesn't protect, but it actually harms. And with that sort of misregulation, dysregulation, it it actually can lead to a lot, a variety of autoimmune diseases. And so 
What we know today is that the immune system uses a lot of different biological pathways. It's a very complex system, lots of organs and tissues. Um, and so what I'm trying to do and, and what many of us do is we really study the immune system on a molecular level. So we actually understand all the molecules and all the pathways that create, you know, normal healthy tissue. And when something goes wrong, what causes disease tissue um, to emerge. And that helps us understand, well, what pathways are shared across all these diseases. So Susan, you mentioned biological pathways, and I'm not sure I really understand this. Is there any way you can help clarify that for me? So when I talk about a biological pathway, I'm really thinking about how cells communicate with each other. And they communicate um, through what we call pathways, which means basically they... Um, well, spit out or secrete. Secrete is the right word, but they basically make chemicals and proteins to help transmit messages. So cells can actually communicate a couple of ways. One is by bumping into one another. They sense that. But the other way is over longer distances through chemicals and proteins. Um, and this, chem this these chemicals and proteins are actually creating a what I would call sort of a chemical circuit so an analogy is if you think about um, you plug something into an electrical outlet in the wall. So you know you're going to get electricity from that. Why? Well, I guess electricity is starting from, say, a power station. Then it flows into a transformer, then to a cable, uh, then to you know a wire, and, and then into an outlet. And that is what powers your appliance. And so you know that on an electrical circuit or an electrical pathway, if any part of that pathway is damaged, a wire or a trans, you know, a, a transformer, you don't get any electricity to flow into your appliance. It's sort of the same thing for a cellular pathway. So the cells use this ordered series of chemicals and proteins, kind of like wires and circuits in a pathway, to send messages into and through a cell to try to get some action out of it. That's actually very helpful. Um, so then, I guess my next question would be, um, so like if I was going to go to the doctor, do, like do doctors know what pathway is causing an autoimmune disease in a, in a patient? Most physicians, they have a suspicion of, of what the pathway, of what pathway might be causing the disease, um, often based um, on their training and, and their specialty area of study. So... For example, um, one group of proteins that may play an active role in making the immune system function normally are, are called cytokines. And so we just discussed a, a pathway. Cytokines are proteins that help cells communicate or signal to one another. You know, cells can't talk, so they just um, communicate by secreting chemicals and then the cell that's near those chemicals can see that chemical, can bind to that chemical, and then have a response. But the idea is that there are sort of healthy levels of cytokines that are being used to communicate from cell to cell. And if a certain tissue in your body or an organ in your body makes too much of these cytokines, um, as an example, Occasionally, they make too little, and that's a problem as well. But then you end up with an imbalance. And so it, it is common that an autoimmune disease will result um, because there is too much of one of these communication molecules being squirted out into the tissues, and you can end up with a different um, disease. And so what's interesting is that in the same pathway that might be... Um, it might be imbalanced in one individual, a certain autoimmune disease may result, but in another individual, it may look a bit different. So there's a bunch of cytokines in everybody's bodies. Some may, some may be, have less, some may have more, and they may present themselves in different ways. Even if, if two people have the same amount of imbalance, it may present itself in two different ways in two different people. Let's say you know, Bob and Sarah each have, they're making too much of a certain cytokine in their immune system, they might still end up with slightly different diseases as a result. And in fact, one may not get any disease at all. But one of the biggest elements that controls how we 
um, present or the, the types of things that go wrong with our body with a certain autoimmune disease is our genetics. And so um, depending on your family history, depending on the genes that you inherited from your mom and your dad, um, that that really affects how you might experience or how your, your body might react to making too much of a certain cytokine. So that's a, that's a big component. But from a drug discovery standpoint, when we understand that, you know, there are patients that make too much of a certain thing and how do we help control that, um, we also keep in mind um, what is it, where is it that this is going wrong? So, for example, if um, your skin is making too much cytokine, you could end up with the autoimmune disease called psoriasis. Um, if your, let's say, your bowel or your colon is making too much of this cytokine, you could end up with an autoimmune disease called inflammatory bowel disease. Um, the same goes for if your body has a dysregulated amount of cytokine being made in the joint. That um, you could end up with rheumatoid arthritis as a result. And what you end up with, it, it includes, you know, not only your genetic background and, and what your body's making too much of, but it also relates to your age, your gender, um, what you eat, what you drink, if you smoke, and those kind of things. Does that make it harder for doctors to um, figure out what's going on in people's bodies then if it presents itself in different ways in different people? Definitely, definitely. It, it, it does turn it into a bit of a puzzle. And so <laughs> doctors do blood tests and all kinds of things to help. But it's, it's a really good question because when you go to the doctor and you say, you know, there's something wrong with my skin or my joints are really sore, um, you're only seeing the result, right, of there's some pathway in your body that's not regulated properly anymore, and you only feel the result. And your assumption may be, well, it's just that. I just have sore joints. That's all I have. But I think what's important to understand is that when, when a pathway is out of control in the body, um, you know, let's say you have excess cytokine in your skin, it actually can leave other organs of the body at an increased risk of being affected by the disease. Um, so, so when it comes to developing drugs that treat autoimmune diseases, how do you, how do you approach that knowing that there's like so many different ways that these diseases can present, even though technically they may be caused by the same thing? Yeah, so that's really important because I think it's, we tend to start studying disease. We say, what is causing this um, and what are the molecules that are no longer in the right quantities in the body? And what are those molecules, specifically these individual proteins? And so this now gets us closer to the discussion of the medicine rather than the disease. What we try to learn is what are the proteins, the molecules that are really causing the imbalance? And if we know that well, or even if it's just a small number, then we say, okay, we're going to make a drug that will literally stick to or bind to that protein that is in quantities that are too high, for example. And we're going to change the way that molecule works. We can shut it down or turn it off, and that's called a, a drug antagonist. Or conversely, we can actually make a drug, bind to it, and turn it on, make more of it as well. And this is stuff that you're working on now, turning uh, stuff on and off? Exactly. And so we design drugs that are exquisitely designed to bind a particular molecule and only a particular molecule. We try really hard to get it highly, highly specific. And that molecule is called the target. Sometimes you hear drug target. So a drug target is the molecule that the drug binds to, and it's the molecule that's going to be um, changed as a result. We want more or less of it. And so Physicians and scientists know that a specific drug has been exquisitely designed to that target and can modulate it, and that's what you want. It's kind of like a wrench on a, on a, 
on a nut, you want the perfect size wrench that will only turn that nut and make that change. Okay, that I can understand. So thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So if, if you've ever looked for tools to a very specific, you know, um, screw head that you, you don't have in your toolbox, you know how frustrating it is. You need a very specific tool. So I think what's interesting about medications, where we know so much about them, they're very very well tested, very well characterized, highly specific. So if a, if a medication doesn't work in a certain disease, it's dosed properly, and the patient takes it, but they get no you know, positive effect, then in part that tells you scientifically that, well, the molecule that that drug targets is not the molecule that's causing that disease. And so, unfortunately, um, something else is in imbalance in that person's body, and the doctor needs to think about what are the other tools I have that would bind to other molecules that might be also candidates as, you know, what's causing this. So it's just deducing. It's just, it's trying and deducing and ruling things out, basically. Yeah, exactly. In a way, the drug also helps us understand more about what is causing your disease. Is it this? Because I have a drug for it. No, that doesn't work. Okay, let me try something else that binds to another protein and does another thing. And it's, it's no fun as a patient to go through that, but I think that's the reality sometimes of medicine. It's certainly the reality of drug discovery. All a drug discovery scientist wants to do in their career is make sure that physicians and patients have these different drugs, lots of different drugs that bind to lots of different molecules, so that we have lots of tools, you know, to, to treat lots of diseases. That, that's really the end goal. So another question for you. Um, how can we make sure, then, that all of these great medicines that we have are being used to their full potential? Right. So... Usually we work on, as you mentioned earlier, you know, one drug, one disease. A drug is designed for a certain disease and tested in a disease, and, and if it's safe and effective, then, you know, it can be marketed. Um, but you, what you might be asking me is what's the most efficient way to test if the drugs we have now could, in fact, treat other diseases? Exactly, yes. And so it's funny because one of the most efficient ways to test, you know, an old drug for a new disease is via computers. And I know that sounds weird, but computational science is really helping us with this idea of, some people call it drug repurposing. And the idea is that the drug discovery community can really take advantage of computing power um, to, not only, to not only understand how different diseases are related to each other, but what drugs we might be able to use for a new a new disease opportunity that it hadn't been tested for before. That actually doesn't sound strange to me with all of the technology out here, uh, out there these days. Um, well, so, so do you think that in years to come, computers are going to help us learn even more about the drugs that are currently on the market today and, and how they can help uh, treat diseases that we're still studying? Oh, absolutely. Um, so what researchers are using right now not only, you know, with computers, but computer algorithms, so programs that help computers string data together, um, something that's called artificial intelligence. There's lots of um, appliances that we use every day that have artificial intelligence in them, and machine learning is another uh, phrase that people use. And basically the idea is that, you know, there's so much information in the world, and we feel that every day when we when we just use our computers and Google search, you're aware of the massive amount of information that's in the world. And so what, what researchers are trying to do is say, listen, we know there's a tremendous amount of research data that is out there and it's written. There's a lot of um, experimental data that's in databases. What we try to do is, as discovery scientists, we let the computer make a prediction. We predict that... Um, you know, this pathway is not only um, in autoimmune disease, but it's also in Alzheimer's, for example. And so in, in the groups that study these particular diseases, we can now go in the laboratory. We can get some molecules that are, are drugs and work with them in dishes and ask, huh, do they actually treat this disease in the lab? And if it does, thanks to the computer, that connection has been made. And if it all pans out, it is a very exciting option because, um, you know, if you think about the time it takes to do clinical trials on new medicines, if we had a medicine that had already been tested for safety and efficacy in some other disease, then it, it might very well cut down the development time because the safety part has been established. 
Um, we have some information on, you know, how it works and, and what patient populations. And then we could simply ask, but for a new disease, you know, what are the options? So without the computer making that connection, it would be very difficult. And I think the, the best part about computational science is that it's so unbiased. You know, computers don't have opinions, and um, that really helps bring to light novel connections that, that make diseases more similar that I just think is, is a very exciting part of, of what's going on in science today. So has this happened already? I mean, can you can you give me maybe some examples? Oh, sure. So there there actually are a lot of examples and and I think some of the the current drug trials that are going on right now are are based in part upon these computational efforts. So for example, um there's a drug that's being used today as a painkiller that was originally developed for epilepsy. And so you can imagine that the connection between epilepsy and pain uh, isn't obvious at all, and and a computational approach helped enlighten, and then um, we're able to actually then give patients the option um, to try that. Another example is a is a molecule that was widely prescribed for inflammation um, is now being tested in Parkinson's disease. Um, you know, again, would you take something for general? Um, inflamed sore joints and and have it treated in a Parkinson's disease patient, that that wouldn't be obvious at all. And that's something that's just recently the use of computers has helped to kind of progress that in kind of a faster way to to, to kind of bridging those two together? Yeah, absolutely. That's amazing. It is actually so productive. And, you know, you can't beat the the cost of the computational data where computers can run 24 hours a day, it's actually um, a very cost-effective way of looking across a huge amount of data and information over decades. That's the other thing. You know, computers can pull data as far back as you need it to um, to make connections. And and as I was doing, you know, thinking about this podcast, I, I realized that there actually are a few drugs that have been now notched up to... 20 or more approved uses, and a lot of them were, you know, identified as a result of making these connections computationally and then testing as well to prove it. But these initial connections are are key to our understanding. So in the end, you know, it is about better understanding disease, and then that really helps um, people who either make or, or test or understand drugs and medicines can really apply um, to that disease. But I, I do think it comes right back to your initial question, which is if we understand disease really well, then it could turn out that one drug can very much have the opportunity to treat multiple diseases. Thank you so much for joining us today. That was extremely informative. <laughs> I got actually more of it than I thought I would, so that's always a bonus for me. Um, so I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. Generally, at the end of each podcast, I try to briefly summarize what um, some of the material we've covered. So let's see if uh, it's stuck in my brain this time. So uh, the first thing, um, cytokine. So making too little or too much of a cytokine um, can result in an autoimmune disease but how it manifests isn't necessarily the same in every person. Exactly, yeah. Um, secondly, um, th- this is why we can use certain medications that target these cytokines to treat different types of diseases that are all caused by the same kind of like happenings in the body. Yes, that's correct. All right, okay. And then last but not least, computers can now uh, help us figure out if there are multiple um, or new uses for uh, um, already existing drugs, uh, which can help speed up the approval and discovery processes and save money as well. That's right, yes. All right. Nice. Wow, I can't believe I actually um, said that correctly, but cool. Thank you once again for joining us, Susan. I really do appreciate you um, taking the time today. Well, my pleasure. I do think that we haven't discussed the borax. When are we going to research that one? <laughs> Um, I'll FedEx you a box of it, and then perhaps we can uh, have a second, uh, uh, another episode dedicated to Borax. (laughs) On it, thank you. (laughs) Thank you again, and uh, look forward uh, for everybody joining us on our next episode of Things That Make You Go, huh? Things That Make You Go.
soul.